All right. So good morning to you all. Thanks for uh, joining me this Wednesday morning. Today, we're going to continue um, in our world of Illustrator. Primarily, well, there's actually not that much Illustrator that we'll be doing today, but we're going to talk about color theory. And this is something that's kind of been coming for a while. Uh, I've hinted around at it. We've, we've mentioned it a few times, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time and a little bit more depth talking about colors and color theory and color space, etc. Uh, we'll then work with some color swatches, both in Photoshop and in Illustrator, uh, though we'll actually probably touch on InDesign with color swatches as well. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Charlie Harper. I know I mentioned that your assignment, your next assignment was posted, um, but I want to make sure that you know what it's what it is and what you're going to be doing with it, et cetera. So we'll spend some time in the lecture talking about that as well. Uh, but before we get started, um, we'll we'll really talk in depth about color theory, uh, and that's kind of an important important piece of the puzzle. So let me share my screen and we'll get rolling here. And where did everybody go? There we go. Perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and jump over into our color theory. So color theory, and this is this is kind of one of those funny uh, slides or one of those funny lectures where by the end of today, when I'm talking about color theory, it makes it seem like color is the absolute most important thing about design, period. And that's probably an exaggeration. Does color play an important factor in design? Absolutely. Does understanding how color works and how it plays into the grand scheme of design important? Absolutely. But it's not the end all that this lecture will make it seem. So take this with a grain of salt, but at the same time, I think it's important. And that's why I spend so much time emphasizing it. So first off, let's start with some of the basics. And this is kind of like what you learned in kindergarten when you were mixing paints uh, originally, but we have what's called a color wheel. And in that color wheel, we have three primary colors. We have red, yellow, and blue. If we mix those primary colors together, so let's say we mix a red and a yellow together, we're gonna get a secondary color, in that case, orange. If we mixed the primary colors of red and blue together, we'd get a secondary color of purple or violet in this case, that's what it's saying. Now, if we mix a primary color and a secondary color together, we'll get a tertiary color. So in that case, uh, if we mixed yellow uh, and blue together, we'd get green. If we mixed yellow and green together, we'd get kind of a yellow green. If we mixed blue and green together, we'd get kind of a blue green. And so that is kind of classic color mixing. And you probably learned this or have an intuitive sense of how this works um, just from working with paint, for example. Complementary colors are colors that fundamentally um, in the design scheme complement each other. And that's because they're directly opposite each other on the color wheel. So if we took yellow, for example, that would be our primary color. The complementary color to that would be purple. So it's the direct opposite. The complementary color of orange would be blue. Now I could flip it around. The complementary color of blue would be orange. So it doesn't really matter which direction we're going, but it's just that directly across the color wheel is the color's complement. So in theory, if we were to use that complementary color together with the primary color, they would work nicely with each other. We also have something called analogous colors. These are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So if we have yellow, we might have kind of an orangey yellow, we might have a green yellow, uh, and those would be analogous colors. They're close, they match each other well, but they provide little contrast. So you might have a whole group of analogous colors that you're using, and then you might use one complementary color to highlight something specific. So we can use those to our benefit in design. Let's talk about color systems. And you've run across this uh, at least a couple times in lecture thus far or, and in your assignments thus far. Uh, we have two primary color systems that we use. The first one is an RGB color system. And this color system is produced with light and mixing light. So it's a little bit different. Now in this color system, we have three different colors of lights. We have a red light, we have a blue light and we have a green light. As we shine those lights together, we'll get secondary and tertiary lights. So if, for example, if I had a red light and a green light and I shined them together, they would form a yellow light where they intersect. 
Similarly, if I had a red light and a blue light and I put those together, I'd get magenta. And if I had a green light and a blue light and I shine those together, I'd get kind of a cyan blue. If I took red, green, and blue all together and I shined them, I'd get white. And so why is this important? Well, this is how monitors and other electronic devices display color. So if we, if we were able to zoom in and, and blow up our monitor and look really closely at it, and they've actually gotten to the point where their resolutions are so high, it's hard to see this. In old school monitors, you, could, you used to be able to see it. Um, but if we got really close and we looked at it, we could pick out that there's individual little dots on our screen that are either turned on or turned off. And it's a combination of red, green, and blue dots that produce the desired color that we're looking at. So obviously the RGB system here that I'm showing with just you know, red and green like yellow, it's much more nuanced than that. This is the simplified version of it, but it's those three colors, those three dots that are, I, are uh, apparently it's still the morning and I haven't woken up yet. Uh, it's those three dots that combine to form all the colors on an electronic screen. The opposite of this is the CMYK color space. And this is the printed color space. So electronic devices are RGB. CMYK is printed. And the easiest way of kind of thinking of this is if you think of a color laser printer. The color laser printer has three primary colored toners plus black. The three toners are cyan, magenta, and yellow. And yes, theoretically, we could combine those three to make black, but it's not quite a dark, rich black that we'd like. So we add a black toner as well. So let's talk about how this works. So this is very different than our, our monitor systems where we're adding color together. This is actually more of a subtractive system. So what happens is we print on a piece of paper, we print with cyan ink, that kind of bluish color ink. What happens with that ink, the, the, what that ink is actually doing is it's absorbing all light except for the cyan light, which is reflecting back to us. That's why we see the color cyan. If we printed, printed with magenta ink, the only thing that's reflected back to us is the magenta color. Everything else is absorbed. Now, when we put print with cyan and magenta together, it's blue light that's reflected back to us. And so we get that dark blue. So it's kind of the opposite effect. It's about absorbing light rather than adding light together. And that's because it's in printed format. So cyan and yellow together end up with green. Cyan and magenta together end up with blue. Magenta and yellow together end up with red. And the cross of all three, or the key color, which is black, forms black. So it's a very different system. So I should actually, before we move on to this color theory slide, oops, let me jump back here. Uh, we should also talk about why these are important. Well, sometimes the translation between these two color systems causes subtle shifts or differences in color or perceived value of color. Furthermore, you've probably experienced this before. You work on your monitor, which is an RGB system, and then you go to print out some document and it comes out of the printer and they don't always look the same. Now, there are ways of color profiling and, and calibrating monitors to try to minimize that effect, but sometimes, right, we print it out and it just doesn't look the same. And that's because we're translating from the RGB color space into the CMYK print color space. And in the translation, something gets lost or something's not quite printed correctly or the colors aren't rendered exactly the same way. So it's important to recognize. So long-term, if you're working in Illustrator and you intend to print something, you'd be working primarily in CMYK. If your only intended output is on a computer monitor, then it makes sense to work in the RGB color space. And you can actually switch between the two, et cetera. All right, continuing on, color theory. The idea of color theory is that there's fundamentally a meaning behind colors. There's a sensory experience that we associate with particular colors, and that if you as a designer take some time and are deliberate in your choice of color, you can use this underlying emotion or effect of color in a particular way to help foster a particular response to your work. So how do we work with color theory? Well, color theory is at its core about developing aesthetically pleasing color relationships. Well, that's pretty simple to think about, but how do we actually do that? 
Well, sometimes we think about emotion when it comes to color systems. So there are specific groups of color that are associated with emotions. So we ha generally have our warm colors, we have our cool colors, and we have our neutral colors. And we can use those warm, cool, and neutral colors to our advantage. The warm colors tend to be red, orange, yellow. They're about evoking warmth, sometimes happiness, fire, et cetera. They would be the colors that are you know, inherently in a fire. And they're, they're often associated with these feelings of happiness and joy. I know this is ancient history to some of you, but in 2009, there was a lot of struggling websites out there and they shifted their color palettes to be more yellow. And they did that on purpose. So it's definitely something that plays into strategies. Cool colors are colors like blue, greens, purples, et cetera. Think of you know, water, cold morning, winter, those kinds of colors. Those are representative of cool. And they're often used in professional or clean designs to emphasize an authority or trust or uh, power of a particular company, establishment, et cetera. And you can actually see this a lot in websites. The neutral colors, the grays, the browns, the blacks, the whites, they're designed to be kind of in the middle. They're not supposed to evoke much feeling in either direction. They're meant to be neutral. Now, of course, we can have a warm gray and a cool gray. We could have a warm brown and a cool brown. Uh, that just has to do with which direction the color's leaning. Uh, I think gray is probably the most common example of this, but that's just kind of a subset of the neutral colors. It's still fairly neutral. So let's talk about colors in specifics. Red is a symbolic of fire and power. And so it's a, it's a color that is a, a dominant aggressive color that's associated with passion or maybe importance or emphasis. Don't know what that was. Uh, sometimes it's about stimulating energy or excitement over something. You can also have the negative connotations of red, anger, emergency, rage, et cetera. There's a reason we paint fire engines bright red. There's something that really stands out. And so you can use that to your advantage as a designer as well, right? Where you can have that particular red stand out against the rest of your work. Let's look at orange now. Orange is generally associated with happiness, joy, or sunshine, uh, childlike exuberance. So it's a happy color, not quite as happy as yellow, but it's definitely an exciting color. Um, some people would associate it with fall. That has to do with more leaf color than anything else, but it certainly has its, it has its attachment there. Um, still somewhat aggressive if you're thinking of it as a negative color. Right? It can also be symbolic of ignorance or deceit, uh, though that's not that common. Yellow, yellow is the happy positive color. This is the color that you color, uh, you know, the kids always color the sun in the upper corner of the page. It's always yellow. It's kind of a joy, brightness, energy, optimism, happiness. Now, of course, we also use yellow to draw attention, just like we do with red, where we might have yellow caution tape. It might be about criticism, laziness, or jealousy. So all of these colors have their advantages but they also have some negative connotations with them. And you have to take the, the, the good with the bad. And you, you see how that plays into your overall scheme or color scheme. Green is usually symbolic of nature, no surprise. It generally has some kind of a healing quality with it. It can be associated with growth, which is also kind of nature related. It can also be very symbolic of money. Uh, and that's actually kind of an interesting one because that's, it's symbolic of money in the United States, but not necessarily symbolic of money anywhere else. And that's because our money is fundamentally green and doesn't have a lot of other color on it. So that association is something unique to the US dollar or the United States, and it doesn't necessarily apply to the rest of the world. So think about that depending on your intended audience. It can also show greed or potentially jealousy. It can also be used for a beginner or somebody who has a lack of experience in something. I think the other thing that's interesting, and I have to mention it, uh, is the idea of green dealing with um, not really the color, but the movement for climate change or uh, you know, sustainability or those kinds of things. And the idea that something's green, even though it's not physically the green color, we're using that adaptation, 
primarily because of the association with nature to say, hey, this is something that's a better option or, or um, is more environmentally conscious than something else. So I think it's interesting that we've adopted green beyond just being a color at this stage. Blue. Blue is generally the, the peaceful and calming color, and it exudes stability and expertise. And you'll see it across all kinds of company websites. If we're looking at websites in particular, it's very, very common on company websites because it's, hey, here we are, we're a nice, stable company. Usually it's symbolic of trust and dependability. In the negative, it might be symbolic of depression, coldness, passiveness, detachment, those kinds of things. So I like to show this as an example. Obviously, this is an old slide. Um, but this was the, the White House website back in probably 2017 or something like that. And you see that it has a, a, a predominance of blue on the page. So it's a nice, stable, right? Here we are. This is a nice, stable, uh, you know, web, you know, presence, et cetera. What happens if we take the exact same page and we flip it to being in red? So this is exactly the same. All I did was I took the blue and I flipped it over to being red. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it feels very different. Let me jump back again so you can see this side by side. There it is in blue. And if I flip it over to red, it definitely feels very, very different. And I like to use this as an example because when you're doing this and you, you show it side by side, you can tell that there is, a, there is a fundamental effect that comes from what color you're choosing on a particular page. And so when you see those back to back, you can say, hey, one does exude a certain amount of stability and, uh, to, its, to its page, and the other one yeah, it just kind of feels off. And that's something that's really, really important to pay attention to as a designer. So here's a newer version. Uh, again, I don't have the current one. This is probably uh, a little bit later on. Uh, this was when Trump was in office, I, I think. And so here's, here's the White House website again in blue. What if we flip that one over into red? Again, it feels really different. So it's your job as a designer to make these kinds of conscious decisions. What do you want this to look like? Let's look at purple. Purple is generally the color of royalty and sophistication, and it shows wealth or luxury. This has to do way back when um, people were dyeing clothes, not with synthetic dyes, but with natural dyes. The purple dye for clothing was the most expensive dye to buy. So it was rare and really expensive. So the wealthy people, the luxury, the, you know, the kings, the queens, the monarchs, et cetera, they used purple because that was the hardest thing to get and not everybody had it and made them stand out. And so it then by its nature became symbolic of that royalty and sophistication. It can also give a sense of spirituality, can encourage creativity. Um, sometimes it's associated with healing or feminine qualities. It can also be a little bit gloomy or sad. Black, well, this is interesting because is black really a color? Or is it the absence of color? I don't know. It's kind of interesting to think of it that way. But black is used very frequently in color design. Generally, it's correlated with power, elegance, sophistication, depth. It could also be associated in the negative with death, the mystery, or the unknown. And it's also most definitely the color of grief, mourning, or sorrow. And again, that's a cultural thing. It's interesting. I think black is one of those kind of bizarre choices that come into play. And black is something that people wear frequently. Architects love to wear black. Designers love to wear black because it takes them out of the equation. It puts the focus on the work, not on the individual. So if I came in and let's say I was doing a presentation and I dressed in a really bright color, maybe I dressed in red, maybe I dressed in pink, I would put a lot of emphasis on myself and de-emphasize my work. If I dress in black, however, Right, I'm de-emphasizing myself and emphasizing my work. So even what you choose to dress in can make a difference in these kinds of presentations. White, symbolic of purity, innocence, can show a cleanliness or a safety. It can also be cold and distance. You can think about like winter and snow. That could, that could be its negative connotation. I like this quote. 
Research reveals that all human beings make an unconscious judgment about a person, environment, or item within 90 seconds of the initial viewing, and that between 62 and 90% of that assessment is based on color alone. That's an interesting thing to kind of unpack here, right? So if we looked at something for 90 seconds, we're creating an initial judgment of that, whether we like it or don't like it, and that's 62 to 90% of that judgment. So more than half, you know, an average of three quarters, almost 100% of that judgment is based on color. So does that mean color is really important? Absolutely, it means that color is really important. So brands, we just spent a whole bunch of time looking at logos last class. All right, I love this slide. And it shows how certain brands have decided to brand themselves with color. We have our neutral brands down at the bottom. Then we have our um, you know, green brands. So Whole Foods, for example, no surprise, they're going to use green. John Deere, tractor company, absolutely, they're going to use green. Some of them are a little bit odd. You know, Starbucks coffee. Eh, I'm not sure why that's necessarily green. I think one of the interesting ones here is BP, a gas producer. Well, the fact that they've shifted their colors to be primarily green is kind of an interesting oxymoron, right? Where they're, they're the opposite of green, but they're trying to present themselves as green. So sometimes it's intentional. Trust, dependable strength, the blues out there, right? AT&T, American Express, Ford, right? Facebook, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so you're looking at a lot of those companies. These are long-standing, stable companies. They're in that trust, dependable blue color scheme. The creative or the imaginative, those are the purple, com uh, the purple companies, all right? Uh, I could also say that they're the luxury companies, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the ones that are here are not really in that category. We're going to talk uh, in depth in just a second about Yahoo. So keep that in the back of your head. Then we have those red and exciting companies. And so they're using that to their advantage. Then we move up into the friendly, cheerful orange companies. And then finally, we have the yellow companies that are out there. Now, of course, there's the outliers, the ones on both ends. We have the balanced and calm. We have Apple. Notice that it's the complete opposite end of the spectrum from Microsoft, which is always kind of interesting, or from Google, depending on who you want to say their primary rivals are. There's Google, right? But these, these colors up here are the all the colors. So you've got two ends of the spectrum on this particular slide. So let's look at some case studies. And I think this is kind of fun. Um, and I'm using websites as a way of uh, illustrating my points today uh, because it's something that you can actually see and, and work with. So there's a website called the Wayback Machine. It's, the, it's based on the Internet Archive. And what they've done is they've taken snapshots of websites over time. And sometimes they don't go back to the infancy, but a lot of times they capture a lot of information. So this is Yahoo in 1996. So this is when I was a kid. And I remember going to Yahoo in this day and age. This was like on the old dial-up modems. You guys have no idea what that's like. But this is what Yahoo looked like in its infancy. So there's not a whole lot of color on the page. I think the internet was new. And the fact that the Yahoo logo was red is kind of one of those... Um, it's like, hey, guess what? We're exciting. Come look at us. So that's 1996. Let's fast forward a little bit to the year 2000. So the Yahoo logo is still red. Hey, we're still exciting. But notice the, the, the incredible amount of green that's on the page. And the, the highlighting of Yahoo shopping, the idea that you could buy things online was kind of new at that point. Of course, it's, it's, it's obvious today, but at that point it was kind of new. So the shift to green here with the green highlights had to do with, hey, guess what? You can buy things. You can spend money here. Let's go forward a little bit. This is 2003. This is the first introduction of some purple into the Yahoo page. There's not a whole lot of, uh, of purple on here yet. Again, it's mostly links which are blue, but the Yahoo logo is still red. And that's 2003. Jump forward, 2005, we're still seeing that little bit of purple. The logo is still red. We're also getting a little bit more blue. So like their search bar is kind of that light blue. Remember, blue is about stability 
and about people saying, hey, yeah, yeah, you can go to Yahoo to do your searching. Right? This is all pre-Google being a big deal. And I think Google was just starting to come in, in in about 2005. And actually, they influenced Yahoo. So this was 2007, and Yahoo said, we need to strip down our page and make it not so uh, full of content. We need to be more like Google at this point. So the logo is still red. The web search button is yellow, drawing attention to it. Then we can jump forward a little bit. Now, you know what? We didn't want to do that. We want to go back to our pages. This is 2009. And this is when Yahoo switched over from being red to being purple. Interesting change. They were trying to present themselves as more of a luxury brand. Not the new and up and comer, but hey, you should have your email at yahoo.com. And so we start to see that introduction of purple. Purple gets a little bit deeper and darker here. I love this, this one. I couldn't resist putting that one uh, on here. The rare sea creature found off the California coast, right? You gotta love it. So this is 2013. We're seeing a lot more purple on the page. Jump forward. Here we are in 2016. Much cleaner page design as a whole, but it's kind of a dominant purple color scheme. Yahoo logo is cleaned up a little bit and it's still that luxury brand in purple. We move forward to 2017. And you can see that this starts to be fairly consistent. 2018, 2019, they've got their stylized Yahoo logo here. I think this had to do with basketball at the time. It must've been in March. There we have it in 2019. The Yahoo logo changed a little bit, but it's maintaining that purple. And then here we are in 2022 with that Yahoo logo. Again, purple. Interesting, on this page, we have, you know, this was obviously war in Ukraine. This was in the spring, uh, although it could still be present today. But notice the red as a, hey, guess what? This is something that's going on. It's a big deal. We're, we're drawing attention to it. We're using that red in contrast. I think it's interesting that the search bar also switched back to being blue in this. Okay, so let's look at another company. Let's look at Apple, 1997. So this is before Steve Jobs came back to Apple and kind of re reorganized and uh, restarted the company. But this was when Apple was struggling in 1997, right? They were trying to present themselves a little bit exciting. So they had the red on there. Again, this is very early stage web design. 1998, Steve Jobs comes back in, big change graphically in the website. Notice we stripped away a lot of the color. I love these computers. Take a look at the, like, the laptop, right? the, the iMac. But this was a big deal at the time. That's 1998. Here we are in the year 2000. So again, we've cleaned up a little bit, but notice that this has a primary color scheme. Now they made this computer in, I think it was purple and red and uh, what else? There was a couple of other colors. Uh, there was like a turquoise and an orange, I think. But they chose the purple as the one that was on the homepage. They were repositioning this item as a luxury item. So they're using color to the advantage here. They're saying, this is an, a luxury item. Let's show the purple one. Then we move forward, 2001. Apple at this point was trying to say, hey, guess what? We're back. We, we didn't die. We're moving forward. We're starting to become a stable company. Notice the Apple logo turns blue. We're a stable company again. I love this, Adobe Illustrator 10. Right? This is ancient history. But at the same time, a big deal. We move forward. Again, a dominance of blue. The holiday gift guide in green. Spend your money here. But for the most part, Apple's into that gray and white color scheme. We jump forward. Again, 2004. Maybe some of you remember these uh, commercials. This was the, the, one of the best uh, branding decisions that Apple ever did when they made their iPod headphones white. And it became a symbol of the fact that you have an iPod, not one of the other devices because your cords were white. And they emphasize it in these commercials. And these commercials and this page use the purple background. Again, this is a luxury item. So they're doing these kinds of things on purpose. 
We move forward to 2006. There's no color on this page whatsoever. We move forward here, 2007. The page itself has very little color on it, but the computers have a lot of color on them. Right? How about this in 2010? Check out the old school iPhone with voice control. It wasn't even Siri at that point. But again, the colors re reserved for just the uh, devices. The website has little to no color. There's a little bit of shine on the Apple logo. Right? We move forward. It's slowly getting darker. That top band is getting darker. We're in 2013 now. Then this was a big deal in 2013 when iOS 7 came out. Um, everything previous to that was always shiny. So if you look at the buttons, you look at the top of the page here, that has a little bit of shadow and shine to it. If you look at the buttons on the iPhone, everything had a little bit of shadow and shine to it. In 2013, they switched with iOS 7 to everything being flat. It was a flat UI. It didn't have the three-dimensionality to it. That was something that Johnny Ives, the chief designer at Apple, decided to do. And it caused a snowball effect with all the rest of the um, companies following suit. So everybody went immediately from the three-dimensional kind of shiny, glossy buttons to everything being flat. And it was all because of this move with iOS 7. It changed the design scope dramatically. Now, interestingly enough, Apple still kept a little bit of shine at the top of the page for a while. Everything else is flat. The font choice is flat, um, et cetera. But the shine stayed up here for a little while longer. And I think that was to make it stand out against the background, against the photos uh, that they used in their website. There we go. In 2015, we're, we're now straight to there's no shine whatsoever on anything on the page. Again, the bulk of the color is limited to the devices. Right, moving forward here, 2016, that band has gotten progressively darker. It's now black. There we are in 2017. All right, 2018, the whole page is black. 19. All right, and here we are in 2022. So sometimes seeing that progression is always a really interesting thing to look at. And I think seeing it through the eyes of a of a company and how they evolve is, is really great. There's tons of information about um, color. Palaton and Colored are both websites that we're gonna go to uh, today and I'll show you in a little bit more depth. If you wanna look back in time and see old versions of websites, you can go to the Wayback Machine. It's the archive.org slash web. It's actually kind of a, a fun rat hole to go down for a while um, as you look at things. So let's look at some images of Charlie Harper. So you can get ready for your assignment 104. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do in assignment 104 is I'm going to ask you to find an existing Charlie Harper image and then to take that image and adapt it into your own. So you're going to kind of tweak it and change it to make it be about you rather than about uh, what Charlie Harper did. So you're not doing an exact copy, but you're basing it on one of his works. And I do that on purpose because I've found over my 15 years of teaching that I used to just say, hey, do a drawing in the style of Charlie Harper. And people struggled to see what Charlie Harper's style really was. And a lot of times if you start with an example and then you adapt it to be yours, you have a better opportunity of actually creating something in the style of Charlie Harper. So let's look at some Charlie Harper stuff. So Charlie Harper was uh, an artist in the 1950s. He did all of these paintings and illustrations by hand not with Adobe Illustrator, but they lend themselves really nicely for Adobe Illustrator. So he did a lot of birds, he did a lot of animals, and a lot of his work centered around repetition and patterns. So this is a, a great example. We're using the rule of thirds. We have a strong diagonal, so we have our compositional strategies covered. We also have a repetition and a pattern, and that pattern breaks in the background with the cloudy leaves. And he's using the shapes over and over again. You can see that this is predominantly about circles, but he also has his little rectangles to represent the tails. But it's really about fundamental geometric shapes and how those shapes work together. So we want to make sure we're recognizing those shapes. We have the vultures coming in and eating the snake. Hummingbirds. Frequently, he shows movement by sh showing outlines. So we've got the hummingbird wings, and there's a whole series of outlines 
that are representing the hummingbird wings. Again, we have that repetition of circles. Sorry, this one's a little bit blurry. And the bird then breaks that repetition and pattern. The two ladybugs dancing. Now, of course, you can Google and find all kinds of examples. This one, to me, is definitely in the style of Charlie Harper, but it starts to break down because there's a little bit of three-dimensionality to it. And really, his is more about layering than it is about three-dimensionality. Some more birds. I think this is a particularly good example of Charlie Harper and how he sets this up with layering. So there's no actual three-dimensionality to this image, but we see a whole series of layers. So as we look at this, if we were to identify it, right, we'd say that maybe the, the, the piece that is closest to us is probably a tie between the leaf and the bug. We'll call it the leaf for right now. So that's level one. The bug is kind of at level one, but we'll call it level two because they're at the same height. You could be flip-flopped. Level three would probably be these rings that go out on the water. Level four is probably the lily pad sitting on top of the water here. Uh, actually, those ones are down a little bit. Those are stones. I forget which one. Anyway, level five is probably the snake over here. Level six might be the, the, the fish. Level seven is probably one of these stones. And level eight would be the crawdad at the bottom of the crayfish. Now, obviously, there's more objects in there, but all of those are planes. Oh, I forgot. This is what we'll call the, uh, the dragonfly layer zero. That's the highest one. So all of those are planes. They're flat planes that are layered up like sheets of paper, not three-dimensionally. There's no perspective to it. And that's a key component of Charlie Harper's work. It's always flattened. Oops. There we go. And so you're kind of seeing this pattern. And these are, again, all Charlie Harper's drawings. So let's look at student work. So this is student adaptations of Charlie Harper's work. Right? So something like this. Again, very much based on fundamental shapes, the circle, the leaf oval, et cetera. Right? The bamboo field. Layering, one bamboo is in front, one bamboo is behind. There's a little bit too much perspective on the nose for my liking. I think that would have been better drawn as a circle with another circle with the nose in it. And then these two circles here and there and the eye circles like that, rather than having that little bit of a slope to it coming out the nose, right? So there should be a top on the nose like that. So, you know, little differences. This was one of Charlie Harper's that was changed, uh, where the student basically did a lot of the same work, but he added the knife blade in, which is an interesting take on it. Right? This could be one of Charlie Harper's illustrations. The termites losing their wings. You saw those raccoons earlier. This group of raccoons is looking for the barbecue. So it's subtle changes, right? The flamingo. This one I have to show uh, because I just love the pattern of it. There's something really creative about the pattern and the way that the elephants work together across the, the different patterns. Um, I've always liked it. It's a little bit beyond the scope of Charlie Harper because of the elephant down here and the fact that his trunk twists around, but there's just something graphically pleasing about it. So I like to show that one as an example as well. OK, so those are just some examples to get you started thinking about Charlie Harper. What I'm going to ask you to do, and let me let me get my uh, sheet pulled up here. Oops. All right, here we go. What I'm going to ask you to do in part one is I want you to go and search for Charlie Harper images. I want you to find a Charlie Harper image and you're going to post it. So you're going to save the image first, and then you're going to post a link or post the image to Canvas. And then I want you to write a simple paragraph that explains what you plan to do to make this your own. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to change the colors, and I'm going to move these objects around this way, or whatever that starts to make it your own. You're going to post that part to Canvas. And that is actually the only required post 
or canvas. Everything else below is about color theory and working with color, but I don't need to see any of that. So I'm going to ask you to do this, but I don't need to see it. The part that I need to see is this first part with your Charlie Harper sample image and how you intend to change it. And that's getting you ready for your assignment 104. So let's start to look at color swatches. So when we start to create color swatches, and you guys have, have experienced this a little bit, you know, we can get to where we have, and actually I should open up, let me open up Illustrator here for a second. There we go. I'm just going to create a new page here. The size doesn't matter at this point. There we go. So when we worked with color before in Illustrator, we double click and we have this color picker. Right? We're picking a particular color. We can work with the slider to change that color. And you can actually see that they're giving us an RGB value, red, green, and blue value of this particular color. They're also giving me a CMYK value of what that color would be. You see, as I get closer to black down here, we're getting more black in the K value. So you can see those numbers. You're also getting a hex code for what the particular color is, right? Just different ways of reproducing a particular color. Now, what about finding our complementary colors? Well, in this case, it's a little bit hard to figure out what a complementary color is. So if you know, we, we know, for example, that uh, we have complementary colors kind of across. So yellow's complement was up here in purple. So if we pick the same color and we move this slider down to yellow, we could theoretically get something close, but it's not as precise as we'd like. And that's where some of these websites come in. So the one that I'm gonna show you first is a website called Paletton, P-A-L-E-T-T-O-N.com. And what Paletton does, and you know, ignore the ads for a second, but it lets us work with a whole set of color creation tools. So first off, we can slide our primary color around the outside. And right now it's giving us kind of darker and lighter versions. So if I picked blue, for example, it'll give me the primary blue color, but then it'll give me a darker blue and a lighter blue in the same type of, of blue. So you could argue that those are more analogous colors or a lighter or darker version. Technically, this is more analogous colors. So again, I'm picking my primary color, say I pick it purple, and I'll get two analogous colors on either side. So there's my primary color, and here's my two analogous colors. And again, they're giving me a lighter and darker version of the same color. We can then move over into what they call the triad. I would argue that this is something like split complementary, uh, which I really like. And that's where instead of picking a primary color and a direct complement of that, we're actually spinning around here and we say, okay, I like this color a lot. Give me a split complement to it. So here's my primary color. And instead of going straight across to orange, it's giving me kind of a red and a yellow. So there's my primary green. And these are two different complements to it. You can see in this visually that it kind of works, right? If we jump over here into yellow or kind of this greenish yellow, we get the, the pink, and or the purple, and they both kind of work nicely against it. As we shift all the way around, there we are in kind of a gold, we're getting a purple and a teal. So that is you the triad. That split complementary? Sorry. To I'm sorry, what? You chose that split, comp split complementary somehow? I chose, it. They Palatin's website calls, oh, I see it, calls here. it a triad, <laughs> but I actually, I think it's more appropriately named a split complementary. But again, that's me personally. Okay. The fourth option here is the tetrad, which is essentially um, two complements that are right next to it. So you get an analogous color. So if I were to spin this color around to red, for example, I get the analog analogous color of orange, so the close by color, and then I get their two complements, which are directly across. So the complement of red is the green. There's that complement. The complement of the orange is this kind of teal color. Um, so this is two complements that are next to each other. So you get two analogous and two complements of the analogous. So again, these are all just ways of helping you create 
a particular set of colors. There is a freestyle where you're picking your own colors. Uh, I don't find that particularly useful on this website. I'm going to go back to the split complementary here. And I'm going to pick my primary color. Right, so let's say my primary color is this purple. Now, how do I go about actually getting information from this? Well, I can look at it, and you see when I hover the mouse over it, it gives me a hex code, 6F256F. So if I went over here, and I wrote right here, 6F256F, there's that purple. So I can use that directly from the website where I'm just kind of copying that particular, oops, come on, there we go. I'm copying that color that I'm, I'm coming over. Notice that if I click on it, I also get an RGB value. I also get a, uh, those are the lab colors. It doesn't look like it's giving me a CMYK value for this, okay? But again, that's a lot of work to go in and write each of these codes down and translate them. So we do have the ability to actually uh, export this. So if you look down here, there's a button for tables and export. It'll give me information, right? It gives me all of this. So I could obviously print it and write it down, but notice there is a tab for color swatches. So if I click on color swatches, I can then download it as a PNG image, as an ACO or Photoshop file, which is probably the most useful. So let's go ahead and download that. So I'll click on it. And it's going to download a mypalette.aco. Unfortunately, this website doesn't write directly to Illustrator. And Illustrator doesn't recognize a Photoshop color palette. I know, right? So we're going we're gonna to work to create an Illustrator version of this in just a bit. Uh, and actually, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll do that. Instead of going to the next website, we'll come back and do the next website. So in this case, I have this Photoshop file. I need to go ahead and I need to open it up in Photoshop. So in order to do that, I'm going to open up Photoshop. Oops, I have to cancel this here. And let's go ahead and let's open up Photoshop. So I'm going to go into my Adobe folder here and we'll open up Photoshop. So that hex is just the uh, RGB hex values, just one after the other, looks like. Uh, yeah, it's it's RGB hex values then, and the combination of which makes the color, exactly. Okay. So the reason the hex codes exist, uh, that came about because of websites and the need to be able to reproduce particular colors. And so like, let's say you have a, a CSS file that's determining the color of text on a particular website you need to be able to specify what color you want it to be. So if you wanted it to be that color, uh, you can use that hex code to represent that color in a web version or a CSS file. Um, so the, the, that's a lot easier than coming up with an RGB uh, array or something in web design. So it became a standard for colors on the web, and now we can use it to kind of reproduce colors but it wasn't, it wasn't designed to reproduce colors first. Does that make sense? So it was to solve the web problem uh, mm -hmm. and that's why we have it, okay. but yes. Okay, so I have Photoshop open, maybe, there we go. Let's go ahead and close this. I'm just gonna open, a, a, or I'm gonna create a new file. Doesn't matter the size, we'll just say create. We're actually not creating anything in Photoshop at all. We just want to go into uh, our swatches and work with our swatches. Now, if you see, there's, there's a few old tutorials on my website, and I may have a few links. And if you look at an old video, you'll see this. Uh, there was an interesting change that happened in Photoshop where they, they removed the swatches from the preset panel. Um, and they did it actually first on the Mac, they changed it, and then they changed it on Windows later. So it became really confusing for people. It's not there. I used to have people go up to the preset menu it was under uh, either file or edit. There was presets. I don't even remember where it is. Maybe they've moved it all together. Anyway, doesn't matter. What we're going to do is we're going to go directly to the swatches panel. So over here on the right side, we can see swatches. You can see that there are already folders that are, that are here. We have our RGB swatches. We have our CMYK swatches. We have our grayscale swatches, et cetera. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to load our ACO file into here. So you'll see that there's a little folder icon that will let us, uh, oh, that's creating a new group. 
can I do it this way? No, hold on. My bad, I thought there was a button for it. There isn't, we have to go to these three lines up here. And from here, we can go to import swatches. So we're going to that fly out menu in the swatches window. We're going to import swatches and we're going to find our ACO file. This is the one that I downloaded, the micepalette.aco and we'll go ahead and load it. And now in the bottom of Photoshop here, you'll see my palette if we expand it, let me scroll down here. Lo and behold, there's all of those colors. And that's great. So the cool advantage here is I can use that in Photoshop without a problem. I could say, you know what? I want to pick this particular color. That's now my foreground color. So when I take my brush and I start to paint, it's going to be in that purple. And you know what? I want this green. So let's go ahead and come over here. And so without having to actually create the colors, I'm able to use the colors. What we'd like is we'd like all of these colors to actually be able to be used in the rest of the Adobe programs. And this is where it would be nice if Palatin just did this. But what we can do is we can come over here into the swatches palette and we can hold down shift and select all of the swatches that are in the My Palette group. So you see how I've selected all of those. And then I'll come back up to this little flyout menu and I'm going to export the swatches, but not this first option. I'm gonna export swatches for exchange. That key word here is exchange. That's where Photoshop is going to write a file that's readable by everything. And it would be great if Palatin just did this to begin with, so we didn't have to go through this step, but they don't. So I've selected them all, and I'm gonna choose export swatches for exchange. And you'll see that now it's a Adobe swatch exchange file. It's a .ase. And so I can call this uh, mycolors.ase, and we can click on save. Now that they're in the .ase format, I can open them in Photoshop, I can open them in Illustrator, and I can open them in InDesign. So here, let's jump over into Illustrator and you'll see that I can open them here. Let me go to Window and then Swatches. There it is. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And I wanna go ahead and I want to open a swatch. So I'm gonna click on that little flyout menu. I'm gonna open Swatch Library, Other Swatch Library. And I put this, there's the My Colors, and we'll go ahead and open it. And there it is. It looked like it may have recognized the other one. Maybe they did an update in 2023. I want to see this right now. Let me go to Other Library, and I'm really curious whether they'll let us read this. Nope, of course not, right? So we can't read the Photoshop format directly, but we can read the ASE, which is right here. So again, in Illustrator, this makes life really easy because we can create a shape and we can then assign our fill color based on these swatches. Furthermore, these swatches are reusable. So I can, anytime I'm working in an Illustrator file, I can open that swatch library and always have the same set of colors. So this is particularly useful if, for example, you're working for a company and that company has a specific color scheme and they want to use specific colors over and over again, you can easily pick the exact color that they want you to use. This works to load in InDesign as well. So I should open up InDesign so you guys can see that one. All right. And again, I just need a, a default file here so that you can see this. So I'll do the same thing. I'm going to go to Window. Oops, I have to close the splash screen here. I'll go to Window, and then I'll go to Swatches, uh, which is where... There it is. It's under Color in Illustrator. So it's Window, Color, Swatches. There they are. And same thing here. I'll click the Flyout menu, and I'm going to go to load swatches. I love how they're always slightly different. Go to load swatches. Again, that was in my downloads folder. And there's my swatch exchange file. Click on open. And there's all of my primary colors and secondary colors. And again, it's just as simple as creating the object or creating the text and then choosing what color you want it to be from the swatches menu. 
So that's how you go about this process. And I hate that you have to go into Photoshop to create this and export it to Swatch Exchange. You shouldn't have to do that, but unfortunately that's the way it is. I do have some files on the website just to confirm that we understand how this works. So in this, I had 15 colors right there. And I have an Illustrator file that says color swatch sample file, 15 colors. Let's go ahead and download that one. So I'm gonna right click on it and say, uh, oops, do I have to click? Save link as, and this is Adobe Illustrator. And again, I'm just throwing it in the downloads folder right now. We'll click save. Remember, I have to choose to keep the file. There it is, Color Swatch 15. Let's go ahead and open that. And what this is, is it's just a grid of, uh, oh, come on. Come on, Illustrator. All right, there we go. Uh, it's just a grid of 15 squares. And what I can do is I can select a square and then I can pick a particular color. Oops, that was all of them. Let me double click to get, there we go. I pick the first one. There's the first color, second one, second color, third one, third color. And it's just a way of confirming that you understand how this process works. Let me come down to the next one here. Let me back out of my group. If you're not able to select them, see this is selects the whole group. You can uh, ungroup that one, or you could use the white arrow to select the individual piece that would work just as well. And then we can go through and we can pick this next group. And you guys get the idea. Now we can continue on. So again, this part is not something that you're gonna turn in, but if you wanna verify that your swatches are working correctly, that is certainly an option. And there's our last one right there. Okay, so if we jump back over onto the website here, and oops, there are other websites. So for example, this colored website has a kind of a different take on it. They say, you know, upload an image and we'll tell you what the primary colors of that image are. So if we went into create on this website, we could do an image DNA. And we can then load in a particular image, or it will look at an image and it'll give the primary colors that are coming out of that image. Just kind of a different take on how they're, how they're working on it. So you could click on open and you could then upload a particular image file, or you could pick one of theirs and it'll give you the primary colors from that. So just like we had here, we can, I think it's under click on save, Right, and here's the ability to download. Notice here they have an Illustrator format, which is nice. Uh, this is uh, oh, there it is. It already downloaded mycolor.ai, and so from here I could just load it in directly into Illustrator. So I'll click here. I'll open my swatch library. We'll go to other library, and again, this was in my downloads folder. There it is, my color. And there's those colors that I just created from that website. This is also not an exchange file. It's specific to Illustrator. So you'd have to take all of these. I'm holding down shift to select them all. And then you could export those. So we could come over here. And there must be a way of exporting them from Illustrator. But of course, I'm not seeing the button. Uh, they did have a Photoshop, so you can do the same process here. I'm not sure why they're not letting me export it. Hmm. I'll have to look into that. Anyway, um, so that's just a different website. You could upload a particular image and get a set of colors from that image. It may be something that you're interested in doing. It may not be, uh, but I like to point that out as well. When you're working, when you're starting to set up your Charlie Harper, think about what colors you might be using. Maybe it's based on what colors he's using, or maybe you're going to think about your color choices for that particular piece of the puzzle. Okay. All right, I think that covers everything I need to cover. Let me check on our 
Photoshop swatches, saving conscious color palette. Uh, and then, yeah, if you have extra time, go ahead and begin on your Charlie Harper composition. You have the skills to start working on that. Remember, we're working with basic shapes, kind of like the logo lecture, where you're using circles and squares and rectangles, et cetera, and then making modifications with the pen tool and the direct select tool. All right, so it's 9.01. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. We're a few minutes early, but that's okay. I'll have my first check-in group. Let's do that at 9.15. That gives everybody a little bit more time to get some coffee, um, and we'll go from there. Unless there's any global questions, then I'll answer first. Perfect. Oh, you know what? There's one other thing I wanted to mention. I will make the, an announcement for this if it happens. There is a possibility that I'm going to have to cancel class on uh, this coming Monday, but I won't know until at least tomorrow or maybe Friday, but I'll make an announcement. As of right now, we'll plan on having class, but I like to warn you ahead of time if something's going to happen. So uh, it's possible that I'll have a, a different commitment that I have to do on Monday, in which case we won't have class. So I'll let you know and we'll go from there, but um, I'll see everybody back for their check-ins at uh, 9.15.